Hi everyone, this is Fide Master Dennis Montecrucis, and today we're going to take a look, or start to take a look, at some of the games that I played from the recent, uh, what was it, I think 17th North American Fide Invitational in Chicago. So, um, it's an IM Norm tournament, and I came close, came up short, but I uh, gave it a good run, and today we're going to take a look at one of my better games from that event. Uh, this was played in the penultimate round against International Master Emery Tate. And some of you may recall that one of my first shows, maybe it was my very first show, although I'm not sure about that. But at any rate, one of my first shows on here was uh, a presentation of a game that I lost to Tate. Very, very interesting game. So this game is uh, less interesting from a tactical perspective, but I think in some ways also a better played game. Uh, I'm, I don't think I'm saying that just because the, uh, the result was different. Uh, as I said, I think there were... I think maybe some deeper and more fascinating ideas in that previous game, but but this was for the most part a very clean game. Okay, well at any rate, let's uh, go ahead and start here. I had white, and I played e4. Tate's a guy who can play many different things. Uh, among the things I expected though was the French, and that's what he played. And here I decided to play a, a bit of a sideline. It's not bad. Uh, I've trotted it out from time to time over the years, with knight to f3 and then knight to c3. All right, objectively, it, it probably doesn't promise much of anything, but it's it's not bad, and it um, it's the kind of variation where a couple of things uh, can be said in its favor. One is that uh, certainly you're not doing any damage, and if black isn't prepared for it, I think white does have chances for an edge uh, against this. A second point in its favor is that, of course, it's um, a bit of a sideline, and so... Your opponents may be less familiar with it, and you get you do get positions that are slightly off the beaten track of, let's say, a regular Tarish, or, and, and you're avoiding um, the winnower variation as well. So it does have its uh, its pluses. Okay. All this is very normal, and the usual move here is c5. And white plays d takes c5, and, and so on. It's just uh, goes off in its own direction. Now, again, I think black can probably equalize against this, but um, it, it's not a bad sideline if you uh, want to avoid the heaviest theory. So I don't think there's anything really wrong with the theory, but just to make your job manageable, this isn't a bad way to do it. At any rate, Tate played b6, and this move both surprised me and didn't surprise me. So it surprised me in the sense that I, I didn't at all foresee it in this particular position, but uh, as I had gone through his games in the French in the databases, I saw that he liked to play b6 in quite a number of settings. So after the initial surprise of not seeing c5, which was probably about the only move I've, I've seen in this exact position before, um, I quickly kind of regrouped and thought, yep, okay, this is a typical Tate move. And certainly it's, it's a common idea in the French as well. Black has this bad bishop on c8, and he'd like to swap it off. So that's the the big idea, or one of the big ideas behind um, playing a move like b6. And I'd seen also in a lot of Frenches that uh, Tate likes to play c5 and then c4 and kind of lock things up on the queen side. So you can see if you play bishop to a6, swap off the light squared bishops, and then play some kind of setup like that, then it uh, really does lock the position up, but in a way where black isn't incurring any kind of uh, fundamentally... Um, any kind of fundamental drawback in this position. So white will have a little more space on the king side, <coughs> black will have a little more space on the queen side, and if black castles long, that may not really be such a factor. So it's uh, it's a very interesting plan, and I had to kind of think here, well, what do I want to do about this? Obviously, white doesn't want to exchange off light square bishops, but is there any promising way to avoid this? So here I would suggest stopping the recording and, and thinking it through. See if you can come up with some useful way to avoid it. And uh, speaking for myself, I, I spent about four minutes here coming up with um, the right move. I, and I think what I chose was indeed the right move. Okay, well, this was something along the lines of my train of thought here. So there are some ideas that have been played here, for example, I mean, in this kind of position, not this exact one. So one is bishop to b5. And the idea here is to meet bishop to a6 with bishop to a4. And then white will subsequently bring the knight to e2, allowing him to castle and also uh, enabling c3, 
when he keeps this pawn chain intact and allows the bishop to draw back to c2. Very logical idea. Uh, I think the reason why I, I rejected this, though, is, um, I'm trying to remember, I think one possibility is that black can simply play bishop to b4 here, and of course this rules out the idea of knight e2 and c3. And if my bishop gets stuck on b3 behind a, a, an unbreachable pawn wall, then this really isn't very attractive for me. So I gave up on bishop to b5. Uh, a second idea in this kind of position is to play the move a4. And the point of this is that after something like bishop to a6, I can maybe play bishop to b5, but again, he just plays c6, and I haven't really achieved anything. Okay, a second idea, though, is to play the move knight to b5. And now this is a bit more interesting. Okay, clearly, if black wants to execute his plan, he has to play c6. And now, all right, your first thought might be, well, gee, knight to d6 check would be nice, but, of course, he can simply take this, and the pawn is probably not going to survive. So I, I consider this a little bit. And I wondered if this pawn would manage to stay alive or not. And um, thought, well, you know, maybe it won't get lost immediately, but it's hard to see it having a, a full lifespan either. Um, you know, perhaps knight to f6, or maybe we should trade first. So bishop takes f1. Rook takes, or probably king takes, would be more plausible. Knight f6, bishop f4, knight e4 and the pawn disappears. Okay, but going back to this position, we see, okay, the bishop is the problem. Well, what if we just play actively here with the move bishop to g5? The point would be that if bishop to e7, well, hey, now knight to d6 check is pretty good. So I get the knight to this great square, and uh, all right, he's going to swap the light square bishop still, but I don't care. I mean, I'm really getting an awful lot out of this position. Or even better, perhaps bishop takes e7, and now if queen takes e7, I have um, knight to c7 check, winning a piece, or the exchange. I mean, lots of good stuff. Um, and so, of course, black has to play king takes. But this is clearly a concession. I play knight to d6. And um, maybe he can try to kick the props out with f6, but uh, certainly I think this is a, a position that I should go for. Going back to this position, though, black can simply move the queen to c8, or maybe play f6. Probably f6 would be the, the more logical choice, as long as uh, there's no tactical problem with it, and then black is okay. But this should give you another idea, and it's the move that I came up with in the game, bishop to g5. Okay, so now I've managed to, uh, well, I've done a few things. So first of all, of course, I'm preventing bishop to a6 immediately, but if it was just a one mover, that wouldn't really be worth discussing. But let's let's look at the options. Okay, suppose black plays f6 here. Well, now I think I can probably take on f6 and then play knight to e5 next move. So if, if knight, uh, knight takes f6, well, now, first of all, e5 is a really strong square for me. This e6 pawn is kind of sickly, and, um, okay, I think I can probably do many things that are quite favorable to my position here. Um, I mean, knight e5 is, looks okay to me uh, with the threat of bishop to b5 check. Um, also aiming at the c6 square. So this, this looks quite good, and there are doubtless other moves that are just fine. Uh, if he plays g takes f6, I think I can probably play knight to e5 here, though I'm not positive. This, this is a bit more speculative. Okay, of course he can't play pawn takes knight. That would just hang the queen. And pawn takes uh, on g5 doesn't look quite so healthy. Uh, I check, he plays here. And now I think just queen f7 check, king d6, knight b5. Yeah, it's mate. So that's rather brutal. More interesting, though, is knight takes e5. And now on um, pawn takes, pawn takes, probably I'm not getting away with this. So maybe this is a bit too optimistic here. Just think about this for a moment. Yeah, this this is no good. Okay, so that's a little too, uh, little too fantastic. But maybe I can play simply bishop to h4 here. 
And now perhaps knight to e5 is on the agenda. So if, for example, he plays bishop, not pawn, bishop to a6. All right, now perhaps I can take, take, and play knight to e5. And here, I don't mind knight takes e5, because if d takes e5 and queen h5 check is still coming, and I have pressure on f6. And if pawn takes, well, pawn takes is still just impossible. So this looks uh, quite good for me. And again, I'm threatening the, the mate with queen h5, queen f7, and then knight to b5. So I think this is um, quite to my advantage here. All right, so if f6 isn't really working for him, then he's left with bishop to e7, and this is, in fact, what he played. But now I take, and notice that I've managed to exchange off my bad bishop. So this is already a little success for me. But now the further point, of course, is that I play knight to b5. And now the c7 pawn is hanging. And black has no really convenient way to defend against this threat. Uh, of course, the queen could go back to d8 but that's not uh, much fun on developing. King to d8, of course, is even worse. Knight to f8 is possible, but then he's not castling, and the knight's misplaced. So finally, he chose to play knight to a6. But by playing this, now, of course, my knight is safe on b5. He's not going to swap off his light squared bishops, and his c-pawn for the moment can't move because of knight to d6 check. So I've gained something here. Okay, bishop to d3. He castled, I castled, c5. Okay, so now I've got a new problem to solve. Now that he's castled, if I play knight to d6, I'm not really achieving very much. And also I'd have to worry about knight takes e5 tricks in some positions. So actually you'd probably play c4. And um, so I just wasn't sure exactly how to meet that um, at knight to d6, c4 possibility. All right. So once again, it's a good place to stop the recording and figure out what white to play ought to do. Might be a few uh, reasonably um, equal, approximately equal uh, approaches to the position, but um, black is at least threatening to, to kind of crawl out of his shell here, and the, uh, the, the initial progress that I've made may be lost. So see what you can come up with here. Okay, well... C3 would be a very natural move, keeping the pawn structure intact, keeping his knight off of b4. But I think I didn't like this so much on account of c takes d4, c takes d4, and now knight to b4, hitting the bishop. And if I try to preserve it with bishop to b1, then bishop to a6, and all of a sudden black is getting a little bit more active than, than I would like him to be. And that bad bishop is now quite a reasonable bishop. So I do like the idea of keeping his knight off of b4, however, and for that reason I chose the move a3. That's one of the, the things that, uh, one of the ideas behind this move. Now, he could play c4, so I, I haven't stopped at that move, but I felt that after bishop to e2, I can play b3, after which I'm breaking up the pawn structure again. After he takes, I can play b4, play rook c1, with an outstanding position. So this seemed to me not a problem at all. Okay, so if he does nothing, by the way, then next move I'll play c3 and then maybe follow up with b4. Uh, again, with complete, um, with a completely solid position on the queen side, I'll have prevented all of his active possibilities over there. My bishop will maintain its presence on the long diagonal, a very strong diagonal, and white should be better there. So Tate chose to play c takes d4. This is a perfectly reasonable move. He's trying to undermine my center, and of course he's done that uh, with the d-pawn. I have no c-pawn ready to recapture. Further, the e-pawn is now uh, less defended, and he can play f6 and attempt to simply uh, explode the rest of my pawn center. Okay, furthermore, he's now clearing c5 for a knight. But now we'll see at least a second point behind my a3 idea, which was to play b4. And so I've still managed to keep this knight out of the game. And by doing that, I'm still keeping this bishop out of the game. All right, well, Tate decided it's time to under, finish undermining my center with f6. I play queen e2. It's a good move. I want to maintain my grip on the e5 square. So he took, I took, he took, I took again. Queen f6. 
Okay, well once again, uh, it's a good moment to try to figure out what to do, and I'll just give you the options this time. Should I play rook a to e1 and try to maintain peace control over e5, or should I play f4 to do so with the pawn? So figure this out, and um, then we'll discuss the, uh, the options. Okay, well I chose rook a to e1, and I think this is the better choice. The problem with f4, I think, is, okay, I, I keep some advantage after this exchange, for instance, but by blocking the e-file, I make his e6 pawn less vulnerable than it would otherwise be. So I, I think by shielding his e-pawn, uh, well, two things. So first of all, I'm shielding his e-pawn from frontal assault. Secondly, as long as his e-pawn is safe, then the pawn on d5 is safe as well. And if, as long as I have an f-pawn, I have the possibility of playing f4, f5 at some moment to uh, not, I mean, that'll exchange off the e6 pawn, but it'll soften up the d-pawn. So I think f takes e5 really uh, reduces my, my possibilities. So I'm still better here, but not as much better as I am after rook a to e1. Okay, well now Tate played bishop to d7. And so finally, at long, long last, he's managed to uh, liberate his bishop, and, but, but only to a very, very small extent. I mean, on d7, it's really in a almost completely passive um, stance here. <coughs> Excuse me. And after f4, I mean, you can see that black's pieces are all very much tied down. So the knight and the bishop are tied down to this, this pawn on e6 and blocked in by it as well. I mean, you can see these, these two central pawns of his are firmly blockaded, and um, they're weak, and they hem in his own pieces. His rooks have uh, half-open files, so the c file is half open and the f file is half open, but it's hard for either of those rooks to uh, exploit that. So uh, white has a, a clear advantage in this position. Unfortunately, at this point, I, I uh, got a little too carried away with the flow of the game. So everything I was doing was working very nicely. I was going forward, um, you know, and I got carried away by that momentum and, and chose, uh, I think, a, a mistaken move here. Even during the game, I kind of realized that it was a questionable decision, but my rather quick uh, analysis of the position, uh, I think, led me to be a little bit overconfident about, about the move that I chose. So once again, I would suggest stopping the recording and trying to determine what the, the best way for White to, um, to, to handle his current advantage would happen to be. Okay. Well, one thing I would say about this is that, um, you know, I, I mentioned the going kind of going with the momentum of the game, but because the game has really shifted at this point, I mean, the, the trend has been favorable throughout, but the nature of the character of the position has changed from what it was earlier. So before, we had queens on, and I had prevented his knight and bishop from even developing, really. So now the queens are off, his knight and bishop have found something that at least vaguely resembles uh, a square, you know, vaguely re resembles development at any rate. And so it's time for me to kind of regroup and stop thinking about the game along the lines that I had been previously. There's just a different set of problems, and uh, as such, it requires thinking and, and looking at the position with fresh eyes rather than um, with the kinds of feelings and, and the kinds of um, uh, opinions and, and tasks and sets of problems that were, were present a few moves before. So what's going on now? Well, I want to continue to restrain his pieces. And uh, also, of course, I want to take aim at this pawn on e6. All right, at some point, I'm going to need to open a second front because I don't think I can attack the e pawn enough times to win it. I mean, he's defending it three times. He can also defend it with this rook on e8. He can also defend it with the king on f7. So he can, he can muster five defenders of this, this uh, pawn, and unfortunately I can only attack it five times. So I've got, or uh, sorry, um, four times. So I can play g3, rook e1, bishop f1, bishop h3, or maybe bishop e2, bishop g4, and then that's it. So, I mean, I could play f5, but since it's unlikely that there's going to be any really profound pin, uh, I think I'm going to kind of max out at f4 four times. But... While I can't win the pawn by this kind of frontal assault, what I can do 
is tie him down as fully as possible first. So playing moves like g3, rook to e1, maybe h4, at least if he's ever threatening to play g5, um, bringing the king perhaps to some central location. So maybe I can play something like king e3, move this knight to g5 in some situations and play king to d4. Okay, that's not necessarily going to have to be the case, but at the very least I can find, I can put my king on e3 um, and, and, and await further developments from there. Uh, another idea, okay, is again to bring the king to e3, then maybe play for g4, g5, and grab some space on the king side. h4, again, maybe maneuver the, uh, the bishop to g4, the rook goes to e1, the king goes to d3. And there, you can see that it'll be quite difficult for black to maintain a, a fully adequate defensive posture for the, uh, the pawn on e6, because the rook will be kicked from f6 and from the 6th rank more generally, and the king won't be very stable on f7. So ideas like that are, are certainly possible. Another possibility here, and this also might be useful to, uh, to take care of any potential counterplay black might try to, uh, to, to gin up on the c-file, would be to move c4. And in some positions I leave it there, in some situations I push forward to c5 and create a passer. So you can see c4, maybe rook c1 next, and then c5. And in some positions I might simply capture on d5 when if he takes back with the pawn, it becomes isolated and perhaps I can break through on e7. And if he takes with the knight, well, then the e6 pawn becomes even, even more weak. So that would have been, I think, a second good approach. Instead, I, I played overly directly with the move f5. So I thought that um, initially, after e takes f5, maybe I can play rook to e7, and if rook f7, play knight takes f5. It all looks very active, and all my guys are going forward, and I thought maybe my rook from f1 will be able to break through to the seventh rank, but it's uh, not at all so easy. And after he played e takes f5, here I slowed down. So I should have slowed down the move before. Unfortunately, I only did it at this point, and really couldn't find any way to a uh, significant advantage any longer. So my initial idea was to play rook e7, rook f7, and then, um, for example, rook takes f7, king takes f7, and now knight takes f5. So something like this I had originally hoped for, but then I realized, okay, bishop takes, and now if I take with the bishop, he just plays g6, and it's a dead end. I mean, there's no good discovery. His king goes to e7 next, and then, in fact, his king is going to be better centralized than my own. And I, I really just don't have anything here. Or if rook takes f5 check, king to e7 is, again, very good. Uh, there's no way for me to really exploit the king's being away from his uh, pawns on g7 and h7. The knight on c7 does the job it needs to, protecting the pawn on d5. And it can't be attacked by either of my pieces. So this is pretty close to an equal position, if not just flat equal. All right, instead of knight takes f5, maybe bishop takes f5 is possible, but even this doesn't really lead to very much after h6. Um, okay, my knight's better than his knight, but in the absence of some breakthrough, uh, I really just don't have very much, if anything, at all. So this was a bit disappointing. Uh, I considered also bishop takes f5, and this would give me still a slight advantage. Bishop takes, rook f takes f5, but again, it's kind of similar to what we just saw uh, a moment ago. So finally I chose knight takes f5. He played bishop takes, I played rook f takes f5, rook f5, bishop f5. And here, once again, it's uh, time to figure out what black to move ought to play. So I, I had seen this and I saw both his movement and the correct choice. Um, I had evaluated one of them correctly, the other one I uh, was too, optimi too optimistic uh, about my chances there. So figure out what black to play here ought to do. Well, white's idea, I think clearly enough, is to play rook to e7. And if he moves his king, then he has to worry about bishop takes h7. Um, perhaps. So maybe king f7 is possible, bishop takes h7, g6. Uh, no, no, then I have, yeah, I have rook to, uh, to g5 then. So, yeah, that, that was uh, a, a real threat. And so that basically leaves him with um, the moves rook to f8, 
and g6 because if you can't play rook to e8 on account of I, I just whoops no, rook to e8 and then I just swap and play bishop to e6 check and take the pawn so rook to f8 looks uh, natural and here okay if I play bishop to d3 I keep a very very small advantage but rook to e7 is the uh, the most forcing move and the move that needs to be considered most excuse me most seriously rook f5 rook c7 rook f7 and now I thought that after rook c8 and I swap that I would be better here but it turns out that after king f2 and in this position here black has a very strong move b5 now normally you don't want to make that move because if you're in a zugzwang situation and the king has to move. You want to be able to play king to e6 when king c5 is impossible on account of b, uh, the, the b6 pawn. So that's why a move like b5 is a bit um, less likely to come into consideration. But just evaluating the position on very concrete grounds, I don't get the opposition. My king is going to have to give way first. So we can see that my c pawn and his a pawn cancel out. And since the king side pawns are symmetrically uh, placed he just copies what I do so if I play g3 he plays g6 I play h4 he plays h5 and so on I run out of pawn moves first there I can push the c pawn he pushes the a pawn and then ultimately my king has to move and then it's just a draw if in this position I try to be clever and play a4 first or play a4 at some point before uh, I play king to d4 in response to king to d6 well, I don't win this one either. So king e7, king f2, king d6. Now he gets to the center first. And after c3, it, the, the tempo race again works out just fine for him. So I got my king to d4, but he regains the opposition at the crucial moment. And this is a draw. And c4 doesn't achieve anything for me either. So with rook to f8, the uh, rook ending, or I should say the pawn ending, is just a draw. And again, bishop to d3, I maybe have a very small advantage, but because his only weak pawn here is the, the unit on d5, and he can adequately protect it, this is going to be a draw. So uh, I caught a break. I mean, he caught a break with my uh, poor choice of f5, and then here I was fortunate that when he played g6, he had simply missed rook to e7. All the same, I, I still needed to, to show some accurate play from this point. So he took, I took. And now he plays d4. And this is a very good move. Fixing my pawn on c2 and uh, with a few ideas. So one is, of course, that if my rook ever leaves the, uh, the, uh, the c file, he has rook to c8. But also, he has the idea of playing maybe rook to e8 and now rook to e3. So this pawn on d4 actually serves as kind of an anchor for him as well. And still a third idea is to play rook to d8 and then d3 just swapping it off but activating the rook so against all of these ideas I thought for a while and played king f2 trying to cover it and one idea is that if he ever does play rook e8 um, e3 I may have c3 or c4 tricks so um, here another move I had to consider very carefully was a5 all right and now on a5 I play b5 fixing the, the pawn on b6, and then after rook to d8, king e2, rook to e8 check, and now um, king to d2 to avoid the check. Now if he plays rook to e5, I play a4, and then if f4, with the idea of swinging the rook over to g5, it looks to me as if at the end of all of this, okay, king f7 to keep my rook from f6, rook to d6, I believe I should be winning in this position. So my my queenside passers definitely outweigh his h pawn, and so this ought to be a win. Okay, he could also try rook to e3. So just coming in directly, rook c6, rook a3, rook b6, and here I, I'd stay, say I'm clearly better. So I'm not 100% sure that this is winning for me yet. He's got a lot of bad pawns, but see the thing is uh, I have to be careful about trading too many of these guys off here. And, for example, I mean, okay, it's not so clear how the uh, my, my c2 pawn will, will be exchanged off, 
But if, for example, we end up with two on one over here on the king side, that's a draw. Uh, also, black might have some, some clever ideas like maybe d3 in some situations, where if I play c takes d3, he plays rook a2 check and rook g2, grabbing pawns and going for counterplay. I mean, he'll have a passed f pawn, he'll have a passed a pawn, and that could, could be messy. Also, I might consider a move like c4 in response. So you can see, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things still happening on the board. Um, so white's certainly much better. The burden of proof is on black, but I'm just a little hesitant to say that it's an outright one in the game for, for me at this moment. Okay, so going back to here, that was on king to d2. King to d3, activating the king may be the best, even though it's allowing him penetration here. So rook to e3 check, king takes d4. Uh, and now you can consider both rook to e2 and rook takes a3, but I think in both cases I'm, I'm doing well. So if rook takes a3, then I just play rook to c6. Um, can play c4 next if I need to, maybe king to d3 if he plays rook to a2. But uh, certainly my pawns are very fast, and um, with my king close to his f-pawn, I, I think it should be fairly routine. So if rook a2, c4, rook g2, Rook b6, rook h2. Hmm. Probably just rook to a6 should be good enough. And then the pawns are ready to roll. So I, I should be winning here. So at any rate, a5 is, is interesting. Trying to save the pawn and maybe get it going a little bit and then play rook e8 e3 as quickly as possible. All right. Instead, though, we played a6, and here, again, it's worth stopping and trying to figure out what white ought to play in this position. So just to remember, remind you of the last couple of moves here, so d4, king f2, and now a6. Okay, well, here, black's idea is to play the move b5, and if he achieves this, then his queenside structure is reasonably solid, and it'll take me quite a while to uh, to grab all the pawns I need to to make a passer over there. So it seemed to me that the best move here is a4. So that way, whichever pawn he pushes, I can fix, uh, I can, I'll push the opposite pawn and fix a weakness on uh, the, the appropriate sixth rank square. So if he plays b5, a5, and the pawn on a6 is weak, or a5, b5, the b6 pawn remains weak. Okay, so he decided to just leave the pawns alone and played rook to d8. All right, again, the idea is to play d3, and so you might think that the right move here is king to e2. But I don't think it is, and again, I invite you to stop the recording and figure out why it's not the best move. All right, well, the reason I think that it's uh, a flawed move, king to e2, that is, is rook to d6, and now his rook is ready to come over to, to the g file, or, or maybe first to the h file, induce h3, and then come back to g6 with some genuine counterplay there. Also, the rook is very well placed on the sixth rank to keep his pawn safe. And, uh, of course, you can always still play rook to e6 and then rook e3. So he's basically keeping all of his options open while adding some more to the, uh, the repertoire here. So uh, I think king to e2 would not be the best move. And so instead I played rook to c6. The point being not so much to grab the pawn, although I, I certainly won't mind taking the pawn, but to keep his rook away from the g file. All right, well now, take goes active, d3, it's the best move. Takes, takes, I took, and now he makes another good move, he plays a5. And the point, of course, is that I'm gonna end up with a passed a pawn rather than a passed b pawn, and that makes it a lot less easy to win than it would otherwise be. So if I have a passed b pawn, uh, especially if I'm gonna go on to win the f pawn, then it's a very simple win. I won't have to worry about the Vancouver drawing method. So we remember we looked at that a few weeks ago. Uh, with the B pawn, there is no Vancouver method. With an A pawn, there could be. So that's what I have to be aware of. All right, so I played B takes A5. There's, there's nothing to be gained by B5 because then he plays rook to D4. He wins the A pawn. And then I'm in danger of that uh, two-on-one ending that I mentioned before where I win his A pawn and his F pawn. He wins my A pawn and my B pawn. And then it's just a hopeless draw. So the G and H pawn versus H pawn ending with rooks on the board is just 100% uh, drawn. So B takes A5 is forced, rook to D4, A6, 
rook takes a4. And now here, uh, I again invite you to figure out how white should play this. So I, I still wasn't 100% sure that um, this was winning here. I was pretty sure, but it, it didn't seem to me to be trivial. Let's put it that way. So I, I didn't, uh, didn't know how to win this with 100% certainty when I first got to this position. So I knew this was about as much as I could have gotten out of the earlier position, but I was a little worried that maybe he was going to escape with a draw here. Of course, one basic plan for white is to bring the king over to the queen side, but then you have to be a little bit wary about black grabbing the uh, black, sorry, black grabbing at least the g pawn, maybe the h pawn too, and getting some counterplay with the f pawn. So objectively, I'm going to be ahead in that race, but sometimes you end up with these positions where Black sacrifices the rook for the a-pawn, Black's king gets active, and you end up with this, uh, this, this draw. So, all right, I, I should be well ahead in the race, and the fact that there are h-pawns on the board will improve my chances of winning. But, you know, I wanted to find a nice, elegant, conclusive way of, of winning this. And I think I succeeded in that task. All right, now the first thing to notice is that you absolutely should not play let's say check, check, and then a7, because then his king gets active. Let's say he goes up to uh, e6 or maybe to g6, and then, okay, I've, all I've done is basically immobilized my own rook to some extent. All right, I've immobilized his rook too, but there is the danger that his king can maybe come over to the queen side and, and help out. So probably I'm winning there as well as I think about it now, but it's um, I didn't really want to let his king... Out of the uh, out of the bag, any faster than I needed to. Okay, so I started off with the move king to e3. Now the first thing is that Black can't grab the uh, the g pawn straight away because of his king being on the seventh rank. So if, for example, the rook came to a2, uh, I could play king to d4, but let's just say uh, king to f4 for the sake of argument here. Okay, now rook takes. Well, now a7 wins because after rook to a2. Rook to b8 comes with check. All right. So for that reason, Tate played king to g7. So perfectly good move. Ready to bring his king up into the action if I play rook to b7 check. And now his rook is, in some lines, threatening to go grabbing my queenside pawns. So again, stop the recording here. Figure out what white's move ought to, ought to do. So I, I think I found a very nice, very clear, conclusive way of... Um, handling the position that really terminated his counterplay. All right, well, we know what black wants to do. He wants to play rook to a2 now and then grab the g-pawn or grab whatever pawn he can. And, okay, I can push my pawn to the seventh rank when he does that, but again, um, it lets his king up and we can end up in some kind of race situation because my I can't promote the a-pawn without the help of my king, and as my king slowly but surely moseys on over there, his king is coming up, his f pawn's coming up, and uh, there's the possibility of counterplay. So again, I don't want to allow it, and I found a way to not allow it. I played king to d3. This is a very, very good move. Okay, the point is, of course, if he does nothing, I'm going to play king to c3 and king to b3, and then move my king on up, and to do so while maintaining all of my pawns on the king side. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, but what about rook to a2? Well, here comes the follow-up. I play king to c3. And this might seem strange at first glance, but the idea will become apparent very quickly. After rook takes g2, which is what he played, I now play rook to b2. And so I've kind of mousetrapped his rook. It can no longer get back behind my pawn. In fact, now I get behind my passed pawn. Tarish's famous rule of thumb about what you're supposed to do in rook and pawn endings, that the rook... Whether, it's, whether you're the defender or you're the aggressor, you always want your rook behind the passed pawn. In other words, in the direction opposite of um, the way the pawn is moving. Okay, so the pawn is going up this way, so we want rooks back here. So we want a rook on one of these squares, not in front of it. All right, when it's in front of it, it just gets squeezed to death, whether it's the defender's rook or the aggressor's rook. When it's behind it, it pushes it at least for the aggressor, for the, the side who has the pawn, and it makes it very, very hard for the pawn to go further when it's the defender. So by playing rook to b2, I've now shut his rook out, and it's uh, 
the game is just won very easily. So he plays rook to g1. I play rook to a2, not allowing rook to a1. He checks. King comes up. Rook c8. a7. Rook a8. And now one last accurate move finishes the job. Of course, it's rook to a6. So I keep his king from coming across and uh, helping with his pawns. And so now I have a nice choice between just coming over towards the pawn, bringing my rook back and playing king b7, or playing king e5, king takes f5, and then either going for the h-pawn, depending on what his king does. If his king goes running over to the queen side, I can maybe just grab the h-pawn, or I can even come back to the queen side and, and try to win that way, depending, again, on what his king does. So it's a very easy win from here, and um, for this reason, Tate resigned in the position. So this was, I think, overall a very good game. I made one quite serious mistake, absolutely, but I think both before and after that I played very accurately and very well. So overall I'm quite happy with the game, uh, especially the opening. I think it was a very logical idea with bishop to g5, followed by uh, with the idea of being able to play knight to b5 and freezing his queen side. Just to recap that. All right, so, so bishop g5 I thought was a very good idea to set this up. I think a few moves later the a3 idea was also quite strong, followed by b4. So that was quite good, I think. Um, and then, okay, f5, as I said, was a very poor move, very impatient move. But after that, I think uh, I think I played well in the rook ending. So starting with rook e7, I think there were quite a few accurate moves that deserve to be uh, well, let's say, reflected upon further. So a4 was quite good, preventing him from setting up the most favorable defensive structure. Rook to c6 was very good, not again to grab the pawns, though that's a fringe benefit, but to prevent his counterplay as much as possible. Okay, his a5 was a very good move. And then again, this key idea with king to d3, with the idea of king c3 and then rook to b2 when he grabs the pawn was, I think, a very nice, elegant way to finish the game. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I uh, hope you learned something as well. And um, next week we'll look at some more games from, from this event. So thank you very much, everyone, and I'll see you next time.